Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Gary. John, how are you? I'm not sure I'm doing so good because I think the first half of the show is going to scare us. Yeah, I was going to say that we should be doing this around Halloween because <laughs> I, I, I agree 100% with you. Um, you know, they say there's two kinds of people, those who have suffered a cybersecurity hack and those who will. And so we're going to learn about that from uh, Jason Masker, who's the Director of Solutions Architecture at Upstream Security. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. And we've got our friend Mike Austin from Guide House Insights. Glad to be back. How you been? Uh, doing well, yeah. Good, good, good. All right, so I want to start out with a scary thing. So so you work for this company that, that does cybersecurity software, and you guys recently put out a report looking at the landscape. And I want to read this from the report. And if this doesn't scare people who are listening, I don't know what would, okay? In March 2003, a team of French security researchers participating in a hacking contest demonstrated an exploit that involved executing what is known as a time check to time of use attack on an EV, OEM's gateway energy management system that allowed them to remotely perform actions, e.g. open the front trunk or door while the car was in motion. Despite the OEM's claims that this was not possible, the researchers claimed they could have remotely gained access to vehicle controls. The researchers were rewarded by the OEM with an EV and $100,000 in cash. So I have a feeling that it, they probably were able to get access. <laughs> right. So, I mean, how is this possible? So, so obviously, uh, you know, the focus on, uh, as the technology evolves, is always on the convenience, right? On the ecosystem, on... The things we can do, the things that cars are doing. Oh my gosh, I can I can take my attention from the road a little bit. It's it's almost driving itself, you know, these types of things. But the more connected things are, the more surface area there is that's that's exposed, and the the more potential there is uh, there is for harm. So the more need there is for for security and protection around those those elements. So when you say surface area, tell tell us what you mean by that. It doesn't mean like sheet metal, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think about surface area as uh, you know, upstream has this this way of viewing it as is in three different layers. Um, you have everything that's on the vehicle and all the technology that's involved in the vehicle. Um, well, of course, that's communicating up to the cloud somewhere on things like telematics. Um, thing, you know, this just uh, there's updates coming down from the cloud to that vehicle. And there's also this other layer of, of APIs of where we have applications on our phones, right? That can remote start our vehicle in the winter. It's very convenient or, or monitor how the battery is charging in the case of an EV. Um, so that's what I mean by surface area. Every single one of those elements that we add is sort of a new point that could be potentially exploited or attacked. So how many attacks take place? I mean, I, I, and let's just talk about the automotive industry. In fact, you know, since we're in the Detroit area, just focus on the Detroit area. How many cyber attacks are there every single day? You know, so what's what's interesting is is uh, in this report, you know, when we look at it and we look at what's really different from reports in the past, it's it's the impact that's that's kind of staggering. I think I think what we saw, you know, we we got started relatively early at Upstream on this, and and so we've been a part of this ecosystem and. And communicating like the new, you know, what's what's going on? How's this? How's this uh, environment looking? And initially, it was it was a lot of researchers getting interested, right, and trying different things. Hey, can we drive a Jeep Cherokee off the road? Can we do that? Can we do this? Can we do that? And, and experimenting. And I think now what we've seen is that um, when you look at the report, more significant than the number that are happening is the impact. Uh, so I think in this report, fifty percent of attacks that we see have have the potential to impact thousands or millions of vehicles versus maybe more like 20% uh, a few years ago or, or in the last couple of years when we we're pushing this report. So when you think about that, it's, it's just kind of the tipping point there where, okay, now these attacks are getting very serious. So it's not so much how many of them you have, it's that what's the potential impact that one, the wrong one, could have with the wrong intent and, and the wrong vulnerabilities and sort of that, that perfect storm of, uh, of impact, right? So if the attacks are getting more intense and more impactful, that means the, the bad guys, the black hats, are, are getting better and better at this. 
Who are they? I mean, who's who's launching all these attacks? Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of incentive, um, and, and and that's probably the most diverse thing that we see, right? Is the incentive? It can be anyone. It's car enthusiasts. Some people just want their cars to go faster, right? And and uh, who's who's keeping them back? They're gonna they're gonna hack their car to make it go faster. There's uh, there's fraud, obviously. There's there's insurance warranty fraud, things like that that are that are incentives. Uh, to make these attacks, and then there's uh, unfortunately the political landscape and actual what you know. Some of them, when you think about impacting thousands or millions of vehicles, can become national security at a certain scale, right? So um, there's there's all sorts of motives, all sorts of uh, kind of forces in play. And I think what's what the real lesson is here is is now this has the attention; it's out there. Uh, it's more than an experiment with a few niche uh, security researchers, right? Uh, and now the impact is is significant. So I've heard there's essentially three kinds of black hats. There's the people who are doing it just for fun. They want to be able to hack in and tell all, all their fr friends they were able to do it. Then there's people who are in it for money, like you were talking insurance fraud and the like. And then there's state actors, governments that are doing it. Are you seeing state actors actively attacking the automotive industry, cars or the companies? Yeah, there, I mean, there's definitely, so we do, by the way, security around not just the, the automotive vehicles, but we're, we're kind of in that entire IoT secure mobility space. So we'll, we secure the EV chargers, we secure the um, pretty much anything you can imagine, mobility connected. Uh, we have a, a aim on securing that. So definitely uh, we did see uh, an upswing, for example, with with the wars with Ukraine, Russia, things going on in in Russia or in in Ukraine uh, with these things that that are impactful, right? So there's definitely some state sponsor, and there's things that factor into 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 the national uh, kind of conflicts that are going on. Okay, so you guys discovered ninety five percent of attacks are executed remotely, and eighty five percent of them are long range. So does this mean like? some dude sitting in his basement and he's hacking something on the other side of the country or the other side of the world or yeah i i, I mean basically I, I think what what we're trying to underscore there is the significance of kind of what we've done uh when when we started with the idea of okay it makes sense right give everybody a an iPhone app or an Android app that can start their car. And why should we worry about if the radio is in range or if there's a big piece of concrete in between me and the car? You know, it makes, makes perfect sense. But when you take that on the flip side, it means that attacking those surfaces has no limit on range either. No longer are we worried about if somebody's in radio range when we're unlocking on our car to, to copy the code, right? It's a whole different type of attack where it doesn't really matter where this attack is being launched from. Uh, it can still be successful. Uh, that's that's just the reality of the way kind of the technology is wired. So just different different uh, uh, type of technology requires different type of protections, and that's that's what we're here to do. So in terms of you talked about the volume, but in terms of severity, is there any trend on you know these are attacks that are just you know messing with people opening their trunks or maybe trying to steal personal identifying information or bricking the radio or even further to like disrupting you know ECU or critical systems so that the car will see that error not move like is there any trend in terms of the severity of the types of attacks or a, yeah so uh, i i think um i think one of the things in the report is that that acknowledgement of the potential impact isn't even saying that the impact was that right it's it's actually saying that wow you know they got through this door if they really wanted to this is the exposure that that uh that could be um because it's interesting you bring up you know are they just unlocking doors or opening trunks. Uh, we do, as part of our VSOC monitoring and, and part of our platform, we monitor things like that and, and have a distinction between things that are benign. You know, if a, if a car's driving the road and you get an unlocked signal, it doesn't make much sense, but just one by itself probably isn't a problem. Could be just a kid in the back with the, with the dongle, right? Uh, but when you start to see that and it's a certain area, a certain model, a certain type of vehicle, now we raise an alert and we, and we have, you know, the, a security analyst kind of actively looking at that because maybe this is just the just the beginnings of, you know, I'm doing some research here to see what I can impact before I go and do something a lot more damaging. When you say VSOC, what do you mean? So VSOC, I should, uh, uh, it's before, not VSOC before Germany, I just drop acronyms, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so SOC, uh, I think um, most 
people on the technology side would be familiar of Security Operations Center. Uh, we pioneered this concept of a vehicle security operations center. And that's really just recognizing that there is expertise in the mobility space. There's a certain level. It's a little bit different than just securing emails, securing networks that we find on the IT side. We're securing a pretty heavy vehicle that could be moving down the, the, the road at a, a pretty fast pace, right? And there's all kinds of logistical things and, and just domain knowledge that goes into that. So we provide a, a, a service, a managed VSOC uh, to our customers that can range anything from we completely manage that VSOC to we cooperate that with their security operations uh, or do it in a build, operate, trans, transfer uh, model. So you have a room somewhere full of screens and you're just like watching all these things happen or? You know? Yeah, absolutely. We have a couple of rooms like that. We've got, we've got one over here in Ann Arbor and we've got, uh, we've got one over in uh, near Tel Aviv, uh, Israel. So round the clock, you know, follow the sun kind of coverage uh, for that sort of monitoring. And then also the ability to shift operations uh, to, to less publicly known <laughs> sites when we need to, to, to keep things running. But yeah, but yeah absolutely. Uh, this, this kind of monitoring, uh, because there's people in process that become part of it too and, and understanding the significance of something that's happening now. Jason, how would you rate the automakers then in terms of hardening their vehicles from, from cyber attacks? I mean, they've been at it for well over a decade now. Are they getting better at it or what are your thoughts? Yeah, abs absolutely. I think, uh, I think when you look at some of the initial, you know, kind of eye-opening attacks, they were relatively primitive. I mean, it was... It was sort of a nobody was looking here before, and now okay, we've we've got to do some things to to secure this. Um, so absolutely, the sophistication is increasing, but I think with you know the challenge that we're trying to meet now uh, is that the sophistication of the attacks is also increasing. So we're we're all seeing uh, you know AI and generative AI impact across the board. It's absolutely we're seeing that impact the attackers as well, and it's it's more trivial than ever to take. Uh, take a vulnerability and take that to an exploit, take that to a jailbreak, take that to a targeted attack than it, than it ever was before. So I think that's, uh, you know, even, even though uh, we can say that the, the defense game is increasing, sort of the pace of the whole arms race is increasing. So when, when you mention AI, you know, I think a lot of people think about chat GPT and, and similar things like that where they might be making up facts whole cloth or, you know, making a sentence that sounds correct but isn't. Um, in your case, I, I assume that's probably a little different. Maybe machine learning is a is a better word for it. But can you explain how you know, how and why AI in in your case is is a specific solution that's not going to, like I said, make things up whole cloth or like you know have uh, be fed bad inputs and then you know come out with bad data on the other side. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I so when when specifically when we're thinking about the AI impact on the attackers, what we're concerned about is the generative capability. And, and the, the easiest way I can explain this is in the same way you can, you know, now go to Microsoft or go to ChatGPT, right, and, and type a paragraph description of an image you want to see, and it just draws it for you. Um, now attackers are able to say, okay, well, this is an interesting vulnerability or bug in the code. Can you take this and adapt it to this specific model of vehicle or this specific, and, and those prompts and sort of that adaption, um, we do see it as an accelerator. It, it, it is, uh, they, it suffers from some of the same things that it's, it may not be perfect or it may be have, uh, but we're definitely seeing an impact of how that accelerates the adaption. And that's really, you know, bugs are announced all the time. It's the time to take that bug and make an exploit then to make an exploit that I can do something with, and then to make an exploit that I can impact a lot with, those are all the times that are shortening, I think, with uh, with the generative AI. Behind but, the and then you're using AI in a similar, like, on your side as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the product, so our, uh, you know, what are you going to do? This is, you know, you can't put a genie back in a bottle. AI is here to stay, right? Uh, so we have a strategy of matching agility with agility. If this is adding agility to the attackers, we certainly want to take and give the security analysts uh, some of that agility in their toolbox. So what we've developed is Ocean, is, is our uh, AI uh, interface that, that we've uh, begun rolling out in our product this year with several customers uh, in beta, and we'll continue rolling it out uh, throughout the product. But this is just a, a simple human language interface that's all about taking all of the insights, all the alerting, everything that our platform is observing and seeing, 
and making that accessible through sort of a human dialogue interface so that you can just ask a question. Hey, what are there any trends in, in the attacks we've been seeing? Uh, this makes it, you know, takes sort of the, the siloed skill set of the security analyst or the data analyst and sort of relaxes that requirement. So maybe the manager can ask a question or, or the executives can ask a question uh, and, and get a straight answer out of, out of the data. Ocean AI then is something that an OEM would buy. I mean, it wouldn't be in yeah, this Mike's would... car that he wouldn't be talking. To. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so not not, not this is definitely a, a B2B, not necessarily a, a consumer facing technology. But this is uh, this is our our feature in the uh, the upstream uh, cybersecurity product uh, that yes that the OEMs the the autos would would then use in their in their uh, security operations to interface and understand the threat landscape. You mentioned trends. What are some of the trends that you're seeing? Uh, yeah, I mean they 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 uh, they vary all the time, right? So the biggest the biggest things in the in the report um, is that that impact of just just the realization that look these are not necessarily local attacks anymore it makes it much more uh, of a tool in in the box for those those kind of state actors or or political agendas out there that hey this isn't this isn't in my backyard it's not where I live right so if I create chaos over here it's it's not as much of a concern um, and then and then the concerns of the impact the concerns that you know where it, it's not so much as uh, I got a door code for one vehicle anymore as you know the codes I'm unlocking, or the things I'm, the security mechanisms I'm defeating, unlock a thousand vehicles or a million vehicles, and what is the potential of that impact? Um, so that's 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 some of what's uh, what's heavy on our mind uh, in in upscaling the agility. So I mean, is is this something that somebody gets the code and basically it's for you know model X Y Z vehicle, and there's lots of model X Y Z vehicles out on the road, and somebody would basically be able to say, hmm, this will be funny. I'll open all the doors on all the Model X, Y, Z vehicles. I mean, is that conceivable? Yeah. Or how, how about I pop all the trunks and everybody just looks off across an ocean of trunks popped in the parking lot, right? Or worse, <laughs> what if you brick every car on the 405 in Los Angeles and well, bring the city to a screeching halt? Well, certainly, I think that I think that's the other thing that that we all get uh, concerned. There was a Netflix uh, film of some type that was, you know, Tesla's piling into a, yeah. and and so absolutely the. I mean, we've seen these types of attacks uh, carried. Now the specifics change, right? The the logistic maybe it wasn't a self driving Tesla, uh, but it certainly was a taxi app. Uh, that humans were following the instructions of, and it it certainly overwhelmed the city in in uh, in Russia, right? When they, when they were all sent, right? When they they were all, all the taxis yeah. to one location yeah. at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And so these things can be uh, absolutely devastating to infrastructure. To you know, you think about emergency services trying to get through there or things like that, right? They absolutely have significant impact. In fact, I think there was another one in Russia again, I think between Moscow and St. Petersburg, where they shut down every EV charging station. With EVs, yeah, and, and put uh, put uh, very unflattering uh, statements about uh, Putin and and everything else on there, right? So, so it can, and then the way the, the attacks are carried out, they, they tend to range like that from the benign, now this is going to be funny, somebody's going to laugh at this, to things that get us worried it's about EVs, they're connected to the grid, right? And we know, you know, the grid cannot handle significant power surges. So the idea that these systems are all connected and, and somebody could potentially fire them all up at once and, and cause greater problems on the electrical grid, you know, those, those types of things are on our mind as well, for sure. What about beyond vehicles then? I mean, I got to believe all these companies are fending off all kinds of attacks on financial systems, purchasing systems. I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know it, even what else that could be. It's interesting. So we're, we're starting in the areas of, of API and IoT uh, where we've realized that in specializing specifically on vehicles, you know, in a vehicle, in a lot of ways, you have the most complicated IoT device on the planet, right? It can't get more complicated. This thing drives, it goes, you know, it can go a hundred miles an hour. It can, uh, it can self-drive. It can, it can do sort of all the stuff. Right. Um, so 
so we are securing a lot more IoT camera type companies and in, in devices. You think about drone companies, uh, even thinking about specialized fleets and specialized types of vehicles and operations, right? Like you've got farming and mining equipment and, uh, you know, we've all got our, our uh, garbage pickup and things like that that have specialized equipment on the vehicles that are also connected and monitored and, and understood. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think this, this does, uh, this trend does absolutely extend to those things. You kind of think about this, the sort of swarm capability of wait, well, what if I hack one, I hack them all. Uh, it definitely applies to that IoT space uh, in general. Is there any solution to any of this on the horizon? I, I remember talking to a, a naval intelligence guy uh, who seemed to be suggesting that maybe nano computing could take care of this. I, I mean, is that dreaming or is it realistic? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of different ways that this problem is being attacked. One of the biggest, I think, is is in the the shift left movement of we're going to make the programming language is more secure by default. We're going to code things and, and build things that are just secure by default, that security is, is, is thought through. And we like to think that the upstream platform helps quite a bit with that, right? Because we can see what's going on now. Uh, we can absolutely take action and, and, uh, and mitigate that as we see it. And we can be, you know, a stopgap uh, while we kind of red circle these problems and, and give give the OEMs the opportunity to shift left and and have those dev cycles to go go make the code more secure, push out the OTA updates. Well, well, tell uh, us so. about upstream. What do you guys do? I mean, I love the name upstream. I guess that's yeah. because you're catching things upstream. Yeah, yeah. So so we we specialize in that secure mobility space, and we do that primarily. Our our secret sauce or our our key innovation is in building a digital twin. So we sit at a point of observation where we can see every remote command that's issued to a vehicle, as an example, uh, every bit of telemetry that comes up from that vehicle. We can see uh, everything that a consumer is doing in the in the app and through the APIs. And we see all of that together, and we build these digital twins of the vehicle, uh, VIN specific to the vehicle. It and must also have the massive control. computing power to, yeah. to, to track. Yeah. I'm, I mean, yeah. there's millions and millions and millions of vehicles out there, right? Can you track them all? Yeah, I mean, uh, we we're trying. I, over <laughs> over twenty five million uh, 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 vehicles uh, on the upstream platform today that we monitor uh, is roughly uh, roughly ten percent of the connected vehicle market out there today. That's that's uh, that's monitored through the platform. So, so yeah, absolutely, we're trying. We so so every one of these vehicles is being monitored in real time by you guys. Absolutely, yeah, to, yep, and. Can you like so? Let's say, let's say the three of us have the same vehicle, and it's being monitored, but John has just downloaded something to his phone from some eh, site, and <laughs> and he uploads it to his vehicle, and Mike and I are straight arrows, and we don't have that problem. Are you going to be able to see his car and our cars and know that his car's got the problem? Yeah, absolutely. Because we have, we would have a digital twin of each of your unique cars. You have a digital right? twin by VIN. Yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. by VIN. So that's a good. So point that's how you that, keep them yeah. all straight from, you know, yeah. separate from. Yeah, each absolutely, other. absolutely by the individual vehicle. So we would see that something's awry with his vehicle, and that that yours are doing just fine. But the same technology lets us also see, you know, the more significant impact of okay, somebody's targeting a specific version of code on a vehicle, a specific make and model, and we're starting to see this impact across the fleet. Um, so we absolutely have that distinction and, and would raise that to the security analysts. And can you inoculate those vehicles against whatever this bad stuff is? Yeah, I mean, so the 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 key way that that's done today is with the OEMs pushing, pushing OTA updates uh, to the vehicles, but we have a lot of partnerships we're discussing with, uh, with onboard uh, technology. Uh, to tighten that up and just make that even even more uh, streamlined and routine. Um, but yeah, they, absolutely. This and this is what I mean when I say we support that shift left, right? Is that we can be the stopgap. We can we can trigger some mitigations that they can take. And maybe they um, have the vehicle sending and receiving less, or do do some things to mitigate that while they update the code and are able to push those updates uh, to make it more secure. I know you're tracking this for cybersecurity, but I see huge potential in terms of monitoring a vehicle with a digital twin uh, to anticipate potential problems that might affect warranty or recalls. Right? Have you looked so, into that? 
So it's, it's uh, yeah, absolutely. So recalls, it turns out that, you know, you, you don't want to recall at all costs, but if it's inevitable, if you're going to have a recall, it turns out that the, the best thing you can do is do that as early and, and, and with as much information as you can have. So we absolutely are working with some of the OEMs on uh, quality and, and those, because when you're seeing all these signals, all the telemetry, everything else, obviously you make a lot more observations than just cybersecurity, right? So, so we're going into those realms, into the realms of fraud. Um, you know, we've got, we've got, we're the land of auto shops uh, here in Detroit, right? And uh, not all of them are, uh, are uh, OEM auto shops or, or dealer They're auto shop shops. shops. <laughs> That's right. And so, and so, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting when you see things uh, like, uh, like maybe mileage rollbacks and, and now uh, an auto is uh, going and having a transmission replaced under warranty. That's a big, uh, big fraud uh, kind of claim, right? So. Uh, we absolutely see yeah, it yeah, like, yeah. branching out. Let's go into more areas. detail because what you're talking about is a car is out of warranty. Somebody's transmission craps out. So they go to one of these shops, nefarious shops. They digitally roll back the odometer. It looks like the car is under warranty and they go get new transmission, right? Yeah. And that just that just costs the OEM, right? So the more they can see. Uh, and then I get back to my my favorite, just the go fast market, right? Of these guys just want their cars to go. Well, maybe they did make their car go faster and they did some sort of damage doing that. Well, that probably shouldn't be a, an OEM repair uh, either, right? So um, things like that, you see um, even, uh, you know, I think as cars evolve, it's it's much much more software defined. We've seen that with Tesla. We're seeing that with uh, with Blue Cruise and Fort, where there, you have more of these like subscription style um, features that are gonna become available on our vehicles. And as that trend continues, uh, it becomes more important to the OEMs to monitor, you know, who's using these things without paying for them, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we we can observe all those types of things as well. So you you have all this data that you're collecting. You know, you're seeing where cars are, what you know, what their current state is. Like you said, 25 million. We've, this has been in the news recently with automakers selling some of that data, much like cell phone companies do, and in general. We've seen reports, you know, the, the the user agreements with the automotive stuff is is pretty gives them a lot of leeway. Are you guys doing anything with that? You know, you say, okay, we can like like a lot of companies, you're saying we can anonymize this and maybe you know make some money from advertisers. Yeah, yeah so we we uh, we have uh, stayed out of the data ownership uh, for now. So for now, we make all the tooling and we bring the expertise, the mobility domain expertise uh, for the operations uh, component of that. Um, but for the most part, all of the OEMs, you know, will deploy into their automotive cloud. So they still own and they still control all of the data. And we have had this because we do have a, a few insurance companies we work with. And every once in a while, we get caught in the middle of you know, somebody asking for someone else's data. And, and this is, you know, you guys have to talk uh, kind of thing. So. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. That as that ecosystem evolves, you know, data and the gathering of data, the the requirements for all that, and what it can be used for. That obviously we've seen that grow over time, uh, and we just try to support it. You know, we're we're fully for from a compliance perspective internationally, uh, we're fully GDPR compliant, can support all of these you know data management and control uh, facilities that are required there. So we just try to support it in the in the best way possible. Uh, uh, realizing that none of the data ultimately is ours, we're we're we're, our, we're the protectors of the data. So, so if you're mad at someone selling your data, don't go to you guys. Not up, to, not up. <laughs> we didn't sell your data. <laughs> All right, l l let me ask you a very simple question. Okay, so what is it that individuals can do to protect themselves from having their vehicles cyber attacked, or can they do anything? You know, the, the biggest thing I, I think about from individuals is uh, I just thought about this the other day because we, you know, you, you swap out a lease, you drive the car home and you got certain things that are, you know, my, my wife always wants the dark background, for example, you know, you got the things you're changing. Well, one of those things these days is to connect it to your home Wi-Fi so that it can receive those updates. And I would say that with these trends, and you guys you might agree now that this is probably more important than ever, go ahead and make that connection. Uh, you're probably, you know, allowing the car to at least update itself uh, is, is, uh, is probably better to have the latest software than, uh, than stuff that's behind. The problem is there's a reason for those updates, right? So um, 
but, but maybe you should go and update your uh, your password into your home router. Yeah, go go yeah. with a real strong I, password. I mean, I mean, obviously, making sure your home now is secure <laughs> is, a, is a factor too. Or if you're very paranoid, hey, maybe just connect it to Wi-Fi once a month and check for updates and and update it manually then. But uh, but that's uh, but yeah, I would say I would say you know we have to start thinking different. The same way, I mean, I think everybody now we've kind of drilled it in. Uh, to the population, right? Windows updates are important. You got to do that every once in a while. If you don't, oh my gosh, you're just asking for trouble. Well, we got to carry that on now to to our more uh, sophisticated technology in our in our vehicles. Obviously, um, you know, safety is a concern when we're uh, when we're relying on these things to transport us and our families. Um, so, so we we want to make sure that those things are probably as critical as as Windows updates in some cases, mm -hmm. right? Well, good. Well, I, we're wrapping up this segment, but Jason, thanks so much for coming on the show. Very interesting. It's scary. Like I said, this is not good. We wish you guys all the success in the world because we want you to stop the black hats. Yeah, and that, absolutely. We're here to hopefully remove some of that fear and scariness and uh, work with the OEMs to, to let everybody know we do have it under control. You know, it's a concern, but we have eyes on it and, uh, and are, are working to, to keep everyone safe. If, if you got 10% of the cars, what about the other ninety percent? Yeah, I mean that. So the part of that is the uh, the EVs have been much more connected, right, than uh, than in the past. Uh, so EV versus ICE, the connectivity of those is is uh, is is quite a bit different. But uh, yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit more uh, more vehicles out there. I mean, I mean, uh, more and more are connected every day than than were before. So, but thanks a lot. Well, good. For, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, great yeah. to be here. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be back to talk more about the latest news in the automotive industry. When the peace and quiet of your morning commute is as comforting as your morning macchiato, that's what really matters. Bridgestone Taranza EV tires, less noise for more quiet comfort. All right, we're back. So you got a tinfoil hat that you'll wear when you're... Yeah. Oh man, we need a Faraday cage around us here or something. You know, it, it, it's unreal. All right, so so he was he was mentioning uh, EVs. Um, so what what's your take on Fisker? Um, boy, there's there's some some great deals. I see you can fourteen thousand dollar discount on an Ocean Sport, eighteen thousand on an Ocean Ultra, twenty four thousand dollar discount on a uh, Ocean Extreme. Well, and if you're lucky, um, they haven't even cashed your check. That was the other news that came out today was that they uh, spent a lot of money and a lot of time trying to track down payments because they didn't have good tracking for that. At that is unreal. <laughs> I mean, that just tells me that, I'm sorry to say, Henrik Fisker doesn't know how to run a car company. Come on, the most basic thing is is taking payment from your customers. Yeah, I mean the I think the the least expensive one though is knocked down to like twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, twenty four nine ninety nine. But yeah. um, oh come on, Mike, it's not tempting at all. Well, who's going to buy a car it. from a company that's on the brink of bankruptcy? <laughs> what do you think, Gary? Do I think anybody would buy it? I think a lot of people would buy them. Really? Yeah. Oh. Roll the dice. <laughs> well, they, they only have to sell five thousand. I think you can probably sell five thousand of anything, but. God help the people who buy those things. Okay, but, but what I want to know is why did it come to this? I mean, we, we talked, I mean, early on, you know, he had the asset light approach that, that he didn't have right. factories he needed to worry about. Right. And, and here he is, a guy who has designed vehicles his entire life and, and you know, has a, put together a, a solid team. And you think, okay, the guy can't help but be successful. Why is it not successful? Well, you know, there's some basic fundamental things that they just can't get done. So they built 10,000 cars last year, right? They could not even deliver half of that to the customers. They've got 5,000 cars just sitting there, which are the ones that they're slashing the price on. I mean, this is kind of, you know, basic how you run a car company. You, you build a car, then you make sure you can get it to the customer, and then you make sure you can get the money from them. I mean, to me, this is just shows such a fundamental flaw in the company that they can't even do the basics. The, I think the light asset part of it worked. I think outsourcing this all to Magna and Magna's building the vehicles, 
Now we know they've had horrific uh, software issues and, and all kinds of other issues. But like I said, if you cannot even deliver the vehicles and can't even cash the checks, what the hell are you in this business for? Yeah, I think too. And the, the software, I think, is, is a big piece of that. It's like, it, it has a bunch of problems. It, that part was underdeveloped. And I think a big piece of why the cars weren't, you know, got terrible reviews. And, and in terms of buying one, that's the biggest risk, right? Because it's not going to get fixed if the company goes under. I think another piece too is just... You mean when the company goes under? I, I think another piece too, though, is, is just you need... A, it takes a lot of money. You know, you look at... Lucid just did a funding round. I think they have like $4 billion in cash. And they're saying, we're going to need more cash. Um, Tesla, after Elon Musk said Tesla's not going to have to go to the market for money, I think since then has raised, you know, something on the order of like $20 billion. And it just takes a lot of money to get off the ground. And, it, and you know, when you start losing it, then the dominoes kind of start falling. Like you can't get, you know, you can't ship the cars out or you can't afford your inventory and then slowly slips away or sometimes. But it, it seems inconceivable to me. Okay. Let's take the software, put that aside. Okay. And, and that seems to me that that is a fixable problem. I mean, if these guys are, uh, you know, dealing with all kinds of cybersecurity issues, I, I have a feeling that there's some coders that would be able to help Hendrick and his people out in terms of getting the software. But I mean, okay. Delivery is basically logistics. Logistics is basically you get on the phone and you call U-Haul if you have to. You know what? And they come and they'll take it and they'll they'll deliver it. How hard is that? I, I mean, that takes that takes people. You know, that's one thing. With <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it, no. It gets back to what I've said, Gary. Is you got to be able to deal with the basics of running a car company, and I think. You know, Henrik is a, is a terrific world-class designer. Everybody, everybody knows that. But, you know, he's designed how many vehicles now? Do they have four or something like that? I mean, it looks to me like he's spending his time designing instead of attacking the basics of how you get this company up and running. And it's all about bringing in revenue. He's not the only one either. I mean, this is what all the startups, they want to you know, instantly pop into huge companies in in the shortest amount of time possible. And I, I think what we're all learning out of this whole experience with all the EV startups is pick just one model, maybe maybe one platform with two top hats on it, get your sales to 200,000 a year, whatever it takes to do that out of one plant. And if you can do that, then talk about the next model that you're going to bring out, the next platform that you're going to do. Because, and we've seen this with Tesla, once it got to selling 200,000 Model 3s a year, it started minting money and it was, everything was gravy after that, but it really struggled to get to that point. And all these other startups, uh, you know, they're talking about, we're going to build this plant and do these models and we're going to do, no, <laughs> get one right and then build on that. So, so Mike, what did, what did you think of the discussion that apparently Fisker had with Nissan, that they would get together and, and Nissan would become the factory for Fisker. I mean, is is does 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 that indicate that startups need a legacy company? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess if you look at Fisker, you know, first they were going to do the direct distribution model, and then that didn't work because distribution centers cost millions of dollars. And if you want, again, if you're, if you're not going to do what Tesla did, we're, you know, we're going to start in a couple of population centers at very slow volume and, you know, eventually build up. If you're trying to go really big, really fast, you need a bunch of money. So in that sense, I think there is, uh, you know, yeah, it helps with the distribution. It helps with development. It definitely helps with, with production because again, your Magna is making money off that car too. So that's, that's slicing a little bit out of the line. The, the main thing I took from it was um, and you, we saw this with, with Rivian when they were talking about all of the improvements in, in how much it costs to build when they were talking about the R2, the new model versus the first one, is I think a lot of these startups, um, I think that the thing that legacy OEMs have is this fundamental understanding of here's how we make something affordable. So my guess is the way that broke down was someone probably looked at it and said, can we fix this? And I said, uh, it's going to take too much time or money to make it turn, to help it turn around. And I, I'm skeptical of that there were talks with Nissan. My my guess is somebody called Nissan and said, hey, you know, uh, we're looking at selling things. And they, somebody in Nissan said, yeah, we'll have a meeting. And I think that's about as, as high a level as it got to. We'll, we'll have a meeting. And 
they had a meeting and Nissan went, yeah, there's nothing here. They should have probably made a car call to a car hauler and gotten some of those 5,000 vehicles and they might have been better. Yeah, on. I did the math on it. What, what was the number I came up with, John? They're going to raise like $140 million, $160 million. That money's going to go to the bankruptcy lawyers. That's not going to save the company. All right. So, so speaking speaking of Nissan and and speaking of reducing costs, as you just did, Mike. Um, so Nissan came out with its new Arc project, and this is going to revolutionize Nissan. And Nissan plans to launch thirty new models over the next three years, of which sixteen will be electrified and fourteen will be ICE to meet the needs in markets around the world. And it plans to launch a total of 34 electrified models from fiscal year 2024 to 2030 to cover all segments with the electrified mix being 40% globally by fiscal year 2026 and 60% by the end of the decade. Of course, they're saying electrified and not electric, so we got to keep that in mind. But this was very interesting and, and it goes to, to the point you're talking about. So according to Nissan, by developing EVs and families, integrating powertrains, utilizing next generation modular manufacturing, group sourcing, and battery innovation, Nissan aims to reduce the cost of next generation EVs by 30% compared to the current area crossover and achieve cross parity between EVs and ICE models by fiscal 2020 or 2030. So... Are they just throwing out numbers, or do you think that's conceivable? I mean, for 2030, I think it's conceivable. That you're just, um, you know, and I think if you look at the at the Chinese automakers like BYD, they they're already on like you know they're third, they're iterating very quickly, and they found that you know those cost savings. It's one of the reasons. There's a lot of reasons, and some of them are that you know other other regions in the world aren't going to be able to to get to that cost structure that that Chinese companies have. But part of it is they're just doing those extra designs. So yeah, by 2030. You're on your third and fourth platforms, hopefully, and you figured out a way to get costs out of that. Um, but yeah, still, there's a little bit of like, these are all numbers that are all, you know, a nice round 2030 and a nice round 40%. So, um, you know, we'll see how it actually plays out. So, so they're claiming that by developing with the family subsequent, de subsequent vehicles, the price can be, cost can be reduced by 50%. The variation of trim parts reduced by 70%, development lead time shortened by four months, and adopting monu modular manufacturing vehicle production line will be shortened, reducing production time per vehicle by 20%. Is that enough, John? 20% reduction time in production? Um, probably not. I mean, if, if this Tesla unboxed uh, uh, assembly process works, Nissan's not shooting nearly far enough. So... I don't know. They, they, you know, they're claiming they're going to sell a million more cars. I, I got to see it to believe it. And, you know, here, here's something interesting. I've been running these numbers on it. You know, you, you mentioned BYD. Last year, they spent $19 billion on CapEx, capital expenditures, new plants and equipment. That's more than GM and Ford put together. It's extraordinary. Last year, uh, BYD broke into the top 10 list of car companies in the world. It pushed Mercedes-Benz off the list, outsold BMW. It's right on the heels of Nissan. So I, I got to believe this is one reason why Nissan says it's got to sell a million more cars in the next few years. But my guess is probably this year, BYD will surpass Nissan. So th this raises an interesting question, and I was talking to someone earlier this week about the subject, and we were talking about the, the BYD Seagull, and, and I know you've driven the car, and that's the $11,000 EV that um, BYD is, is selling. And, okay, if you think about it, you know, tires cost what tires cost, glass costs what glass costs, you know, seat material, seat material, da 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 so how are they able to get such an inexpensive vehicle? And it seems that no one else can do that. Well, I, there's probably some other Chinese companies that are coming close. Number one, they've, they've got scale. They've got volume. Uh, and they're adding to it, as I just said, with their CapEx expenditures. The other thing that I just learned this week is that BYD operates with two engineering groups, 12 hours a day, each one. They are on a 24-hour constant. I've had suppliers say, we're, we're doing business with them. We can't keep up. We cannot keep up with them because they're moving that fast. And they also uh, 
just because you've got business with BYD as a supplier doesn't mean you keep it. You know, if you're a tire supplier, you, know, you mentioned tires, they'll go around to other tire suppliers and say, hey, here's what we're, we're, uh, we're getting tires for right now. You want to beat that price? So they've got this complete feeding frenzy, no loyalty to the supply base whatsoever. And they just keep driving costs down and down and down. And they're very good at what they do. They're, they're, they're churning out very good cars. Is that sustainable though? It would seem so far that it is. I think the Seagull too, if, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, if that's one of the, the cars that has a sodium ion battery. The sodium ion, it's a different chemistry. It's a little lower power density um, and it, it can't charge quite as quickly, but it's really cheap. And, um, and China has a few factories that are building these batteries, a lot of it for stationary storage. But, you know, there's, there's talk of that being on the order of like 50 bucks a kilowatt hour, you know, like, like a, a third to half of what other batteries are. So that's a big piece of it, too, is you have a slightly smaller battery in that entry level model and you just have no battery cost. But OK, but let's let's say that let's say that the car had an ICE engine in it rather than an electrical or EV. OK. It would still be cheap. It'd be cheaper. Right. And, <laughs> right. And, and again, I get back to this question of whether could, could General Motors build a car like that in the United States? Hell no. And, Especially and, not with UAW labor. So is, is it all the issue of labor that... No, that, no, no, no. That, it, it's not just labor, but it's, uh, it's speed to market. It's, you know, uh, how quickly can you get, you know, if you're doing 24 hour uh, every single day, product development, and you can bring a, a, mar a car to the market far faster than your competitors, you've got an advantage. And if you can take uh, half a year, a year out of the PD product development process, you've just saved a, a ton of money that way too. So, I mean, it, it's a machine that the rest of the world is not ready to compete with yet. Well, also, is it profitable at 11,000? Or is this just saying, look, we want rapid expansion and we'll We'll take a bit of a So hint. just to answer your question there, now th this is, I, I can't speak specifically to uh, a Seagull or a, uh, any of their other electrics, but last year, uh, BYD posted a net profit of $4.1 billion. Ford posted a net profit of $4.3 billion. So they're making money. Yeah. Now, Ford had a bad year, admittedly, but still... It shows you that this company is is coming on like gangbusters, and it's making money. You know, we had Mickey Bly on last week, um, the head of global powertrain for Stellantis, and he mentioned that they've got engineering centers all around the world, so they're working 24 hours a day. So BYD is not the only one that's doing that. Yeah, but my guess is Mickey's got uh, uh, engineering centers around the world that are working mostly on regional development. So his South American team's working on South American stuff, his North American, North America, Europe, blah, 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 where it seems to me that uh, BYD is, it's all based in China and it's it's all working on one product line uh, that is is just giving them a constant. I, look, I, I heard today from a very senior executive here in the Detroit area that He's heard BYD has 50,000 powertrain engineers. The company has over 700,000 employees. Mm. That's more than Toyota, more than Volkswagen. So, Mike, what, what is your sense of the possible popularity of a vehicle from China in this market? I, I mean, I think if you came in with something for $20,000, I think, you know, as, as long as it holds together for a couple of years, I think people would, would go for it. If you look at, um, you know, the growth right now with higher, so far in the beginning of the year with higher interest rates and, and just rising prices, a lot of the growth is in those smaller price segments. And, you know, frankly, like a lot of automakers, especially the domestic American ones, have kind of given up on making anything that sells for $25,000 or less. They all have, you know, one or two models and those are selling well. And I think the, but yeah, I think if, if a Chinese company came in with an ultra cheap model, I, my, my gut feeling is people would put aside any worries about where it comes from and just say, look, I can get a brand new car for not a lot of money. So John, would, would this then cause the traditional manufacturers to say, we got to start building those too? 
Well, you know, look, there, you know, GM's got some affordable cars. They all come from Korea. Ford's got, you know, the Maverick. It's made in Mexico. You cannot make uh, a cheap car, if you will, I, I would say with UAW labor, the, the labor rates are just substantially above, substantially above any low cost country rates. So I, I think they're all keenly looking at this. You know, Ford's got this Skunk Works program trying to come up with a cheap EV. We know about that. GM's got to be doing something. Stellantis has got to be doing something that we don't know about yet. And Toyota and Honda and the rest of them. But uh, look, they're, they're all scared silly about the, the emergence of these really good Chinese companies. And, you know, I just quoted you guys some of the facts and figures of BYD, which is at the top of the heap there. They're, they're scared of what's coming. But what I wonder about is, is okay, um, you know, Mike, as you're suggesting that, you know, the, the um, MC3, as uh, our friend Joe White calls them. Um, Motor City 3, right. Has, has, has basically a focus on pickups and large SUVs because they make a lot of money there. And they're basically saying, you know, the lower end of the market, we, we don't get such good returns. So we're going we're gonna to seed that market basically to the others. And, and uh, you know, you had... Um, Kia come out with a with an attractive looking uh, replacement for the Forte, calling it the K4. So they have a new nomenclature that it's K and then numbers following it. And you know, so this is a you know comparatively inexpensive car that looks looks fabulous, looks great, and I'm sure people are going to buy it like mad. The question that I have is if BYD builds this mythical, mythical factory in Mexico and starts shipping cars over the border and and uh, there isn't a hundred percent tariff on them. Um, would the MC3 basically say, you know what, we're doing really well with these pickup trucks and big SUVs, and we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna be concerned about that. And no, I mean, I, I don't think they can afford to because I think that you know there's just enough erosion there, and I think you know the big pickups do make them a ton of money, but they're largely a North American piece and. You can't, you're not going to be able to survive on just North American volume at the size that they are right now if they want long term, you know, that long term existence. Um, and to me, it's also like this is just history repeating. When the Japanese automakers came in, when the Korean automakers came in, it was they exploited this niche at the bottom of the market and saw growth. And then, you know, the domestic automakers did scramble and say, wait, we got to respond. We got to have our version of it. I think, I think they will do that. But I also think like, there will be damage if if someone like BYD did build that Mexico plant and then got into the U.S. market. The the biggest ones at threat, though, are the Japanese and the Koreans, you know, to any incursion into the American market by low cost Chinese cars. Because to your point, the Detroit Three have largely abandoned that segment. I mean, uh, I, I, there's very few UAW U.S. made vehicles priced under thirty thousand dollars. The, the base price might be, you know, like twenty eight thousand. They, they've largely walked away from that. So, I mean, if cheap Chinese cars come in, it's going to be Toyota, Honda, Kia, Hyundai that are going to be first impacted uh, by it. But Mike, you made a really good point. That's how the Chinese would come in at the low end, where they know that they can have a huge cost advantage, and then start to move up scale and 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 threaten the MC three. Maybe not with pickups and, and body on frame uh, SUVs, but everything else. And, and, you know, too, it's like it's not, you know, again, looking at, at the evolution of Japanese automakers in the U.S., like that's a 20 year time scale. It's not like they're going to come in and wipe someone out in five years. If, if they did, that would be you know, pretty astounding. But, you know, that's the piece, too, is that um, I think that the automakers need to be alarmed now so that they're ready to respond because you can go, oh, it's no big deal. They only sold 100,000 cars. Well, 10 years later, when they've you know, got up to a million or something, then you have a real problem that you, haven't, that you ignored. All right, John, so I got a question for you. Um, so news came out this week of the 2,100 workers that make up the three work crews at the Rouge Electric Vehicle Center in Dearborn. They'll be 700. Yeah. 1,400 are, A, going to be moved to the truck plant making Broncos and, and yeah. Rangers, and some of people will basically take a buyout package and say goodbye to Ford, okay? Is, is someone going to get in trouble 
in the Ford Glass House for wildly overestimating the popularity of the F-150 Lightning? Good question. Really good question. If somebody's going to get in trouble for it. You know, what it shows is if Ford had stuck to its original plan with the Lightning, everything would be hunky-dory right now. But remember, they came out and they, they had this small addition to the assembly plant in Dearborn that makes the F-150 and said, we're going to make Lightnings and this. It was almost like a, a shuttle line so they could shuttle stuff off, put it, you know, the batteries and everything and, and shuttle it back in. And then orders, I remember they had what? Over 200,000 orders. They shut down orders. the orders because, you know, they're burning up the... Right. And, and so they said, hey, we're going to double it. We're going to double production of it. And then they doubled it yet again. And uh, then the buyers didn't show up. They ran out of uh, early adopters. And like I said, if they had just stuck to their original plan, everything would be just fine. Because that's what they're, they're shrinking down to, is their original plan. And they announced it this week, and it's as of April 1st. I mean, they're not wasting any time here. It's just like basically, uh, oh, you know, you used to drive to Dearborn? No, you're driving out to Wayne now. So what's your take on that, Mike? I mean, I think Stellantis had some layoffs, too, that they they blamed on the EV transition. And I think some of this is, um, you know, yeah, that's just a convenient narrative to say, we're going to cut some jobs and see if the stock price goes up. But I think the other piece, too, is all these companies... I don't know, they, you know, maybe they were like drunk on Tesla news or something, but they all thought that they were going to jump, you know, by the looking back, it was like they all thought they were going to see this explosive growth in EVs. And and again, this is a long term play. It's it's going to play out over the next six to 10 years. And and so you put all this money and like surprise, you weren't, you know, you weren't seeing double, you know, doubling your your sales every single year. You're still seeing strong growth, but like, no, you're not going to switch over to EV in a three year span. I think that's really the problem there is they just kind of forgot fundamentals. If, if it was a new product in ICE, just like a new segment or like, you know, bringing the Bronco back or something, you know, they wouldn't have made those same kind of projections or the same kind of investments. And you know, so to me, it's like you forgot your fundamentals and now people, you know, people are paying the price for it with their jobs and people in the glass house probably, you know, maybe aren't going to get affected. You know, I, I, the, the Stellantis thing, I, I've been thinking this odd uh, for, for a couple of years now. It's easy to get rid of people in the United States. It's really hard to get rid of people in Europe. Really hard and really expensive. So if you're Carlos Tavares and you're thinking, look, we need more synergy here. We've got to reduce headcount. Kick them out of America because uh, we, we, we can chop 400 people like that. Without any warning, none whatsoever. You know, they had a mandatory work at home day, mandatory last Friday, and then let 400 people know you're out of a job. It was just like you could never do that in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've been saying this for a while. If I was in a staff job at Stellantis, finance, HR, legal, I would be real worried because those jobs can be taken over in Europe. You're, you're just going to load up your European workers on this. Well, now it's spread to engineering. They got rid of a whole bunch of engineers too. And uh, I think it was Automotive News that reported this. If in the United States, you're going to get rid of 500 people, you've got to give them like 60 days notice. If it's under that, you don't have to give them any notice. Mm. And so it would seem... I don't know this for a fact, but it would seem that Stellantis is gaming the system. Get rid of 400 people at a time. I think more cuts are coming, and it will be in the United States, not in Europe. You know, Mike, I think it's interesting you were saying about how these companies have basically fumbled on the fun fundamentals. And earlier when we were talking about Fisker, Fisker not having the fundamentals. <laughs> I I'm wondering which is worse. I mean, obviously the the MC3 will stay in business and Fisker may not stay in business because of its lack of understanding. But I mean, doesn't this seem to indicate like the entire industry, whether you're a traditional or a startup, it's in such flux that you can't put your arms around it? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, it's easy to sit here and say, oh, they forgot their fundamentals. It's like, you know, well, yeah, I didn't, I don't have to make any of these projections or make, you know, billion dollar bets uh, that, you know, could either make a company survive or go under. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess it's it's probably better to have the fundamentals and miss them. Um, 
and be able to recover than than Fisker having it. But I, I think there's also just there is this overall pressure of like you know you got to make the number go up and and you know AutoLine has probably talked about this a lot. Like automakers in general don't get the respect on Wall Street that they think they deserve based on their market cap versus the amount of money they bring in and their profit margins. But um, you know there is also this piece of like maybe autos are always going to be an unsexy segment and um, you know trying to do that with this big electrification push or a big self-driving push, like that might have been really tempting. But maybe the lesson here is that, like, you know, you gotta just keep doing what you're doing, and even maybe just try to survive. What what you just said, I think, is profound. Seriously, what these car companies, the legacies, the MC3, have got to do is just accept what they are. They're never going to be Teslas. They're they're never going to have spectacular, you know, market capitalizations. But what's wrong? with selling 5 million cars a year and making $10 billion in profit. What's wrong with that? And, and, and to try to, to think that you're going to do a whole lot better than that, to me, is completely unrealistic. I, 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 I can't imagine that anyone in Auburn Hills, downtown Detroit, or Dearborn would accept that plight i think that they would oh you know we we've we've got it all happening don't you know what what don't you realize about you know our our fabulous technology and we just hired this guy from apple and you know and we just hired some guy from paypal i mean it's just well and none of the banks that have your institutional shareholders are gonna like that either i know they're they want to see you know we're we're in this constant growth almost sickness right uh i i think reality will set in before the end of the decade and uh, look, here's the big problem for the auto industry, at least in the, the mature markets, US, Europe, Japan, Korea, they're not growing. They are not growing. And so if you look at their revenue on an inflation adjusted basis, most of these companies are smaller than they were a decade ago. Some are the exception. Toyota Toyota's doing pretty good. Toyota is pretty impressive. But the rest of them are either barely growing or shrinking. And so to, to think that you're going to get these fantastic valuations, I, I think, is delusional. And that's a good point to end. <laughs> I hate to end on a sour <laughs> note, but let's come back next week and do another show, Gary, and, and hopefully and, we'll find some really good news. And, and we'll have Charlie Chesbro of uh, Cox Automotive on telling us about how uh, the companies are doing in terms of sales. And uh, yeah, some are doing fine. Some are doing fine, but Cox just came out, Cox Automotive just came out with their stuff on. Uh, EV sales are going to look very good by the end of this year. By their by their forecast. I know you can I, disagree. I, I, saying, I, I read their stuff and their statistics and their statistics. So let's just <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, what's the old saying? There's uh liars, damn liars, and statistics. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to that next week with we Charlie. Will. But Mike, thanks so much for coming back on the show. Good yeah, to have you. Always glad to be here. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Okay. See y'all. Thanks for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey.